Hey everybody, it's Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. We want to welcome you to this video, as well as to our YouTube channel here, Grace Life Bible on YouTube. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell as a way of staying current with the ministry when we go live from our assembly building on Sunday mornings, as well as when we create content for you here midweek, we would certainly appreciate that. As always, we thank you for tuning in. Our featured book, this week and until the Easter holiday is my book, Don't Pass Over Easter, a new defense of Easter in Acts 12, 4. This is the time of year where this uh, conversation about this verse comes up a lot in uh, amongst people that like to discuss issues related to text and translation. And if you're interested in a slightly different take <clears throat> than what you might have uh, customarily have heard, uh, please consider picking up a copy of this book and checking it out. Again, don't pass over Easter, a new defense of Easter in Acts 12.4. Also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this as an alt tech site should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're into alt tech sites or just like an alternative to YouTube, please consider checking us out here on Rumble. Those of you who have been following the channel here of late, you know that I've been midweek talking about um, some spinoffs on the preface and the preliminary material of the 1611 in my From This Generation Forever class that I'm teaching during the adult Sunday school hour at Grace Life Bible Church. We've been in this study for a long time. We've recently been looking at issues related to the preliminary contents of the 1611. So we've been talking about the 1611 as a historical artifact and looking at what's in it, what was contained within the 1611, and what does that tell us about the values, interests, and concerns of the people of that day um, as far as what they would have included in the Bible? And we started looking at that preliminary material back in Lesson 190. Then in Lesson 191, I covered some things about the Epistle Dedicatory and the statement in the Epistle Dedicatory about one more exact translation. And that is what spun off into this series that I've been talking about here midweek. Um, I do encourage you, if you're interested in getting this information, um, please consider going through the From This Generation Forever class. After we talked about the title page in the Epistle Dedicatory, we talked about the rest of the preliminary contents. And now we're in a series looking at the preface that I've called Producing a Proper Perspective of the Preface. And we're systematically working our way through all 15 subsections of Miles Smith's famous preface to the AV 1611 and trying to really dissect it and understand it uh, within the co historical context and time frame that it was uh, written in. So if you're into that, if you're into history, if you're into the history of the King James Bible, if you want to know more about that, please consider uh, checking out those studies. But midweek, I've spun that into this series, Did the King James Translators View Their Work as Perfect? And in the first episode, we looked at false friends and the prefaces to the AV 1611. And so I looked at Mark Ward's concept of a false friend, and I suggested that the word exact in the epistle dedicatory in the statement, one more exact translation is a false friend, that there is a meaning of exact there, according to the table alphabetical from 1604, that means perfectly done, uh, that is obsolete. And so we talked about that. And then we looked at more about that in the second episode, more on exact in the epistle dedicatory. And then last week in our episode, we looked at thoughts on the uh, thoughts on perfect in the preface. And so I laid out these notes and presented them in my video. And then I presented them on uh, in church last Sunday in lesson 195, where we've started tracking with occurrences of the word perfect in the preface. Now, this video is being filmed on Friday and it's going to be released tomorrow morning on Saturday morning, which is not my normal schedule. Um, we've had bad weather here in Michigan. Uh, I've had some cancellations with school as well as some issues with some, uh, internet connectivity as a result of some of the storms, etc. So it just, uh, didn't happen earlier in the week. So I wanted to set aside a few minutes here to, to, uh, continue with this. And what I thought we would do is just continue looking at these occurrences of perfect in the preface. I don't anticipate this being a long video, but we did cover um, three occurrences. The word perfect occurs six times, or a form of perfect occurs six times in Smith's preface. And those forms, again, are perfection, perfect, perfected, and imperfections. 
with perfect occurring more than one place. And in the last video, I showed you how perfect is used by Miles Smith in different ways. And we teed that up or framed that up first by looking at the table alphabetical. Then we looked at and noted the occurrences, the 99 occurrences and 94 verses of the word perfect in the AV and demonstrated from the text of the AV that the word perfect is used in more than one way in the AV. And so it wouldn't be any shock then to find Miles Smith using the word perfect in more than one way, given the specific context in which the word is being used. And so we covered that here in this particular video. And in this video, or in this in these notes that I presented in the last video, we also talked about the absolute or the ultimate sense of perfect, okay? as well as the lesser senses of perfect. We talked about perfect when applied to humans, as in Psalm 33, 33, 30, 37, 37, mark the perfect man. 2 Timothy 3, 17, the man of God may be perfect. And then Psalm 19, 7, applied to the scriptures themselves, that the law, the law of the Lord is perfect. And we also, so we, we talked about the absolute sense and then the lesser senses, and I covered this in more detail also in Lesson 195 that I taught last Sunday. So we've been tracking with the word perfect. And we have looked at a few. We looked at the first three occurrences uh, in the last video. And I want to look at a few more. The next occurrence of perfect in the preface or a form thereof is in this section here. <clears throat> a, sanct a satisfaction to our brethren. <clears throat> and we see it in this sentence right here. Yet for all that, as nothing is begun and perfected at the same time, and the latter thoughts are thought to be the wiser, so building upon their foundation that went before us, and being holpen by their labors, do endeavor to make that better which what which they left so good, no man we are sure hath cause to mislike us. They, we persuade ourselves, if they were alive, we uh, would thank us. So the idea here is Smith is addressing the, the, what they're doing in the translation and how they're taking things, they're taking prior English Bibles and they're using them in their revision of the Bishop's Bible, okay? And he says here that nothing is begun and perfected at the same time. And he's clearly talking then about building upon their foundation. So he's talking about a process here, a process that has begun and perfected at the same time. So perfected here has a specific meaning, okay? Now we could come in here to the verb OED uh, entry, and we can look at the first definition here of per, uh, perfect as a verb. Notice transitive, to complete or finish successfully, to carry through, to accomplish, okay? To bring to fulfillment or full development, and notice that this is obsolete, Okay. So notice, again, the language of the preface. The language of the preface, nothing is begun and perfected at the same time, and the latter thoughts are thought to be the wiser if we building upon their uh, upon their foundation that went before us, being help hoping of their labors, do endeavor to make that better which they left so good. So the word perfected here is clearly talking about a process of completion or finishing or bringing to uh, accomplishment, something that had, or full development, something that had already been started in the way Smith is using the word there in the preface. Now we could also look up the word perfected in the lexicons of early modern English, and we can see a smattering of, of uses here. 1552, perfected and ended. So we see the idea of it ending, something coming to an end. Um, 1578, perfected, performed, brought to an end or conclusion from 1578. So that's that, that's really the same idea that Smith is talking about. He's saying that nothing is begun and perfected at the same time. So nothing is, he's saying it's not begun and brought to completion at the same time. And he views their work as translators as building upon the work that had already been done. And so they left good ground, so to speak. And then Smith and the translators are expanding on that, endeavoring it, endeavoring to make it better, endeavoring it, endeavoring to, um, complete it, perfect it in the sense of bring it to an accomplished end, the way we see here in OED definition 1A, as well as in a host of the different uh, examples here. So there's a lot of things that are, um, uh, the, the lexicons of early modern English, I'll leave a link in the description to this video, 
and you can search this out and see the kinds of connotations. Here's one from 1599, a dictionary of Spanish and English, and notice that perfect is, is, is dealt with um, deceased out of this life, perfected, consummated. It's dealing with this. It's dealing with being brought to an end. Um, so we, we understand the meaning of the word. So what Smith is getting at here is that nothing is begun and perfected at the same time. So the meaning there is they are endeavoring to take the prior work and bring it to a completion. And again, to me, this dovetails perfectly with what we've seen in the prior videos here, that they were going to make one more exact translation of the scriptures into English, that they viewed their work as as bringing that to uh, uh to, to a completion now Smith is talking about later on in the preface. And by exact, we mean a table alphabetical 1604, perfectly done. I've shown you the definitional uh, information about this in episode one and two. I don't want to repeat all that, but go back and check that out. So we see the use of the word perfected now in the preface. Now, if we keep going, we're going to get to the one that everyone wants to talk about or often comes up in conversations of the preface, and that's in the section, an answer to the imputations of our adversaries, okay? And he's talking here um, uh, about the king's speech and how the king's speech can be translated into all these different languages, and it still is the king's speech, okay? No cause, therefore, why the word translated should be denied to be the word or forbidden to be current notwithstanding some imperfections imperfections and blemishes may be noted in the setting forth of it. So even though there is not pristine perfection, it is still the king's speech, okay? It doesn't have to be verbatim identical. There can be some imperfections, there can be some blemishes, and it's still the king's speech, all right, in, in the illustration that Smith is using here. So let's read the next sentence. For whatsoever was perfect, there's the next one, under the sun, where apostles or apostolic men that is endued with an extraordinary measure of God's spirit and privileged with the, pri the privilege of infallibility had not their hand. So in this case, perfect is being used here in the absolute sense, in the sense of flawless, faultless, um, without defects of any kind. It, and it's used in, in, in the context as a direct sort of a juxtaposition to imperfections here, right? And they're saying, for whatsoever was perfect under the sun, were apostles or apostolic men, that is, men endued with an extraordinary measure of God's spirit. So here, the word perfect is that absolute sense, that sense of cannot be improved upon uh, that we saw in the last video. So Miles Smith... Miles Smith uses the word perfect and forms thereof in different ways, okay? So it's a mistake, and this has been my main point, okay? It's been a mistake. It's a mistake now to go to the preface and say categorically that they said that their work was not perfect. Now, you there's so much that has to be unpacked in that that is lost in the language change and how Miles Smith is using these words, Okay. And so I'm, I'm, I, am, I am meaning and endeavoring to take the concept of a false friend and use that methodology to show that we have to be very careful when we understand the preface and what is being said both in the epistle dedicatory and in the translators to the reader. And like we saw in the, uh, the essay from uh, the, the anthology in, in episode number one, there's good evidence to suggest that both of these prefaces should be read together. They're to be read in conjunction. And I just saw something this week connecting the title page and what is said about the title page with the epistle dedicatory, with the preface, the translators to the reader, to make the point. There's no doubt that in this case, where they're talking about perfect, they are talking about perfect in the absolute sense of somebody that has a special measure of the Spirit of God upon them so as they cannot err that they have infallibility, all right? So when the translators view their work as say that they've produced one more excellent translation of the English Scriptures, excellent means perfectly done. 
There's a meaning and definition of excellent that is related to perfect. There's a meaning of perfect that is related to excellent, and it's in the circumscribed boundaries of definition 6B from the OED. So when they're talking about there, when Smith is talking about that type of perfection, this is what he means. In a state of complete uh, excellence, free from any imperfection or error, defect of quality cannot be improved upon, flawless, faultless. That is what he's meaning when somebody is has an extraordinary measure of the Spirit of God upon them so that they are in, they have infallibility, meaning they cannot err. They, they, they cannot say something wrong because the Spirit of God is moving upon them to say exactly what the Spirit of God wants said. Now, that is one definition of perfect, and that is what I would say is the ultimate absolute definition of perfect. When the translators view their work as exact and perfect, they are meaning it within the circumscribed boundaries of definition 6B. And again, this is the fourth time I've showed this. Definition 6B, accurate, correct, specific of a copy representation, accurately reproducing or reflecting the original of a notion, thought, record, etc., exactly corresponding to the facts This is now an obsolete. They viewed their work as perfect and exact according to definition 6B. Now, I have tried to lay that out here in this small series of four videos. The first one is quite long. It's over an hour. These next ones are not quite so long. As a means and a mechanism of of, of trying to push this conversation forward and to try to draw out some discussion about it in the public space around the concept of false friends. So um, hopefully you found this interesting and beneficial. Now, I would also encourage you, keep tracking with what I, where I'm going in my dissection as we look at a proper, per, producing a proper perspective on the preface in my Sunday school class, because we are getting very deep into what Smith is arguing, what, how he's arguing his points, what he's using to justify his arguments, et cetera, as we get through this. So hopefully you have found this interesting. You can uh, you can absorb this class in a couple different formats. One here is right on the Grace Life Bible Church website. I'll leave a link in the description for this page for the From This Generation Forever page. This has all the lessons going all the way back to lesson number one. We are going to be teaching lesson 196 uh, just a couple days from now. Another way is to look at on this blog. As you can see, I, I need to update this again. But there's a blog that I created to go with the class, the From This Generation Forever blog. And then I'm also rebroadcasting the early episodes of the, or the early lessons in this class <clears throat> on this channel. And the reason I'm doing that is they used to be on the private channel of a saint in our assembly before I understood how YouTube worked. And so I'm trying to migrate that content off of that saint's uh, YouTube page, putting it here and then creating not only a master playlist for the entire class, but also smaller topical playlists uh, that you can avail yourself of. So I hope this was helpful. I hope that uh, you can uh, share. If you if you like the content here, please like this video, share it, leave a comment, tell somebody else about this channel. We appreciate anything that you could do to help us uh, along those lines. Listen, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ, If you've never relied exclusively on his shed blood as the only total complete payment for your sin, his death for you on the cross, his shed blood and payment for your sin, his burial and his resurrection as the only payment for your sin, stop relying on your own work, your own effort, your own ability to keep the law, religious works or performance of any kind, and trust and rely exclusively on Jesus Christ. He was delivered to the cross for your offenses. He was raised again for your justification. And God is ready, willing, and able to give you eternal life as a free gift if you would trust the finished work of Jesus Christ. Trust Christ today before it's everlasting too late.